Some of you may recall uh, that uh, last week we were a little bit ahead of where we are now. It's like we're going backwards. I think Mark pointed that out at prayer breakfast the other day. Uh, and that's because uh, we're going to go back earlier part of this chapter uh, because it's Epiphany Sunday. And uh, just in case, you know, I don't mind sharing uh, the how I kind of come up with the, the themes and all that. Uh, most of the time we follow the lectionary and we have, there's four lectionary readings and we do them usually on Sundays uh, with the two lectionary readings that are read plus the one that John does is the responsive reading. That's a lectionary reading and then the sermon text. We pick one, at least one, maybe two texts for the sermon. And sometimes we'll put those into a theme and I usually, uh, the United Methodist Board of Discipleship has a suggested theme and uh, some backgrounds and stuff that they use that I, I usually just use their uh, suggested theme. Sometimes I'll, I don't go, like it or whatever and I'll go, I'll go something different. But as far as the sermon itself, uh, <clears throat> I, I, you know, that's one of those things that I, uh, I struggle with. I'm still trying to figure out how to preach, you know. Uh, but as far as, uh, there's times when when I'll read the text, and it'll, it's, it, the sermon just comes easy. And so early in the week, I, I already know pretty much what I want to talk about. And then there's other times where, you know, like this passage, where you've, you've preached this many times, and you struggle with it, and, uh, you know, you kind of have an idea, you know the text, but it doesn't really come together and then, and until maybe that morning or whatever. So uh, a lot of this came together that way. Um, and I don't normally write out my sermons uh, because I want to be able to interact with you. Uh, but I do jot down a few, few thoughts and sometimes an outline or some things that uh, I want to, to mention. And so that's kind of what I, what I have here. Uh, the, the wise men, uh, this Sunday we talk about the epiphany. Uh, and as we're kind of going back to look at that, we think about uh, what it was all about and how that uh, these wise people they're called uh, saw this particular star or whatever it was in the sky. We don't know exactly what it was. It could have been a nova. It could have been a particular star. It could have been a planet. Uh, but they were astrologers, uh, astronomers, actually. And, and in that day, astronomy and astrology and science were all kind of lumped together. Uh, into a science field and, and religion and all that was, was sort of intermingled. And they paid attention to the signs and to the stars and uh, the word magi is where we get our word magic. Uh, they were uh, actually paying attention to the stars and to the sky. And so this particular star that they saw for them was something very significant and they followed to where that star was. And uh, we don't know exactly how many they were. Uh, we, we represent three because there were three gifts. And the three gifts that were given were gifts that were um, probably brought by, uh, to represent different ones, but there were probably more than three because uh, you know there, there were probably women with them that in that patriarchal society, they didn't always mention women. Uh, but there were probably uh, maybe 300 or more. They traveled in caravans, and so there were probably a lot of people. But these gifts that they brought uh, all had something that they represented. And they came for one purpose, their main purpose. They did not come to get anything, really, and at least not at that time that we know of. They came to worship. And they brought these gifts as an example of their... Uh, you know, from, from their homeland. These would have been gifts that would have been found uh, in, in their homeland. Uh, some believe that they were uh, probably in the area of Turkey or Iraq, today, what would be today Turkey or Iraq, from, from that area. But the gifts, of course, of gold, uh, as uh, Archer was talking about this morning, uh, gold, actual gold, uh, <clears throat> and, and the gold, frankincense and myrrh. And the gold, uh, as we understand, probably represented a king. Uh, gold would be significant of someone who was wealthy and of royalty. And, and frankincense was a, a kind of a, a spice that was used uh, uh, sort of for worship. 
and, and a lot of times uh, incense was burned in the temple and uh, these kind of spices that, that they used uh, could be used to, uh, for an aroma and, and thought of as worship. And then myrrh, uh, normally used to, uh, in the cases of a body, they didn't have embalming in those days, and still many of those countries do not do that. They, uh, they use myrrh for the scent, and it was for burial purpose. And if we think about that today, how does that apply to us today? I think we can say we kind of do the same thing in our worship. As we think about gold, uh, each and every Sunday we bring to the worship our gifts and our offerings. That's our goal that we bring to Christ. And we're getting ready to do this uh, three lanes of giving and, and the uh, winter harvest that is finally coming to, to us on uh, next Sunday when we eat our soup bean dinner and have a, a final harvest come. And normally we used to do that in the fall, but because things were so crazy, we changed that to the winter. So in this winter harvest, we are uh, basically uh, offering our gifts to God, our gold, if you will. And then the incense, uh, if you think about that, when we come together to worship and offer prayers and those things and confessions of sins, that is sort of like an incense to God that we do every Sunday. And then when I think about the myrrh, uh, in a little bit, we're going to offer the communion to you. And the communion is our myrrh that we offer to God because it signifies and remembers the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. So in a sense, we're still carrying on the tradition of, of the three wise men, or however many they were, the three gifts anyway. And, and to think about the wise men, I think about the, the reason they came was to worship. They came to worship. And they didn't just come, uh, they didn't just get in the car in a nice warm car and drive to church like you and I did. They had to travel thousands of miles on camels or whatever through desert and through all kinds of uh, perilous uh, environments in order to get to where they were going. It meant something to them to worship God. As I think about that, I think about the fact that you and I don't have to struggle that much. You know, we might have to wrestle with the kids. Uh, we might have to uh, you know, worry about getting ourselves ready and time and all those things. But for the most part, we are able to come in a pretty comfortable, safe place to worship. But not so much at that time. But they came to worship the king. And they came with a specific purpose in mind. So what is worship all about? I was thinking about that. I was thinking, why, why do we worship? And what does worship bring? And what do we bring to worship? And the first thing I jotted down was this, that worship is a respite from the weary world. Worship is a respite from the weary world that we live in. It really is. It doesn't matter what's going on outside those doors. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. Worship is a place for us to come and put all that behind us and just worship God and realize that we for this hour, it's just us and God. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. You know, I grew up in a home uh, where, you know, I, I watched my mother who uh, took us to church, and she didn't have the best life in the world. And she had to deal with an alcoholic, abusive husband. And times were tough sometimes. And I remember having you know, seen her go through those times, but whenever we would go to church, and I was just a little kid then, but how much it meant for her to be at church. And we, you know, we drove to church and drove a little further than a lot of us go, but we went to church every time, every Sunday. And Sunday night, <laughs> when the doors were open, we were there. Sunday school, we were there. Because she believed not only in worship for herself, but she believed in bringing up her children in church and the significance of that. And it had an impact on me because I remember, I didn't understand a lot of what was going on at that time, but I remember that at church she was the happiest I ever knew. There was always a smile on her face and mom was uh, not one to hide her emotions and she was very uh, excited to be in church. She cried a lot in church. She shouted and she was just 
uh, excited to be there. And I remember many times seeing uh, the expression on her face and the joy in her heart I, I could just sense that there was something special about this place that I didn't quite get. I didn't understand then what meant so much to her. I didn't understand why it was so important for her to drag four kids in spite of having to put up with all the stuff she had to put up to church every Sunday and us kicking and screaming and fighting that we didn't want to go half the time. And she did it again and again and again and again. And I didn't understand it. I understand a little bit more now. Because for her, worship was a time for her to connect with her God, a God that had brought her to salvation. In fact, it was the same God that the night that she was saved in revival, she would not wait to be baptized. It was a winter night, and they had to break the ice for her to be baptized, and she lost a shoe in the process. I've heard her tell that story many times. But for her, worship was a priority. It wasn't just something she did if she had the convenience of it. It wasn't something she did if nothing else was going on. It was a priority. Now today, I'm afraid we worship a whole lot of things. But Jesus is not always one of those things. We worship a lot. And, uh, you know, anything you give your devotion to, you really worship. Where your heart is, your treasure also. And we worship movie stars, and we worship singers, and, and we worship uh, sports players. Uh-oh, I'm getting in trouble now. I better, I better hush that now. We worship basketball players. We worship, I remember uh, preaching at a church one time, and the piano player come up to him and said, now UK plays at 12 today. And I said, okay. I guess she expected me to cut my sor sermon a little short that day. Well, I didn't. But I, I, all I'm saying is this today, is that we worship a whole lot of things. But really what is important to us is what we worship. And what should be important today is that we worship God. It was so important that these wise men were willing to travel thousands of miles. There's people in other parts of the country, in Africa and places, that will walk for miles just to be able to come to a house of worship like we have. There's people today in China and other places that are meeting secretly in houses worshiping God just so they can have an opportunity to connect with God. When I was in the National Guard, uh, I, I've told you before, I was there for a while and uh, I had to have surgery and received a medical discharge. But while I was in, the, in basic training in Fort Leonard Wood, I remember uh, going several weeks. I was a young preacher. I was only like 21 years old. And I remember the first time we got the opportunity to go to church, I jumped at the chance. And I got to go to church, and I don't even remember what denomination it was. But they asked for volunteers to sing in the choir, and I signed up. And we sat there and began to worship God, and they began to sing that song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. And the tears began to fall because I realized that for an hour, I could forget about all the cursing and all the anger that was going on between, uh, you know, the drill sergeants and all the people that were giving you a hard time and all the push-ups in the mud and all that. And for one hour, I could connect with my God. That meant something to me. It's such an important thing for us to be able to come and to worship. I hope we don't take that for granted. As we are looking toward a new year here, this first Sunday, Epiphany Sunday of a new year, I hope you'll make that a priority. I know there's always going to be times where that is not a possibility. You may have to work or different things. But make it a priority for you and, and your family. The second thing is this, that worship is a way to give back to God. Worship is a way to give back to God. And I just uh, wrote down a few things. Uh, like the wise men brought their gifts. That was their way of giving to a king because he deserved it. They were gifts fit for a king, worthy of a king. As we think about the winter mission gifts and all this, and, and we, we give these gifts, it's a way of us to be able to give back. You know, a lot of people... Uh, say a lot of bad things about Christians these days. There seems to be more and more hostility toward the church and anybody who claims to name the name of Christ becomes a target sometimes. But you know there's one thing I believe that, that the church does that a lot of these people out there don't do is that we, the church, the Christians, 
do most of the giving in this world. And we come together and, you know, we would not be able to do what we do if we were not a congregation that comes together and challenges people to give. And we do a lot of challenging, I know that. You know, it just seems like it's, 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 it's a lot of things. But that's what we're supposed to do. God has given us so much. God has blessed us so much that part of what we ought to do is to have a gratitude that we, uh, a, a heart of gratitude that we want to give back to God. And this is our way of giving back to God. You can't outgive God and you can't repay God, but worship is a way to do that. And then also I mentioned, I wrote down that worship is how we express our hearts and our faith. Worth, worship is how we express our hearts and our faith. It is in worship that we can connect with the Creator and express through singing. And you know, the part, the reason we sing, by the way, is not so that we can show off how talented we are, although we have some very talented people. The reason we sing is not just because we like to sing, although I love to sing. But the reason we sing is because the Bible talks all through the Scripture about singing and music, and it's a part of worship. And it talks about making a melody and singing to the Lord and singing a new song. All this is a part of worship. And it's an expression of our hearts. So when we come together and we lift up our voices and we sing, it's not to sound pretty. It's to let the God of heaven know that we are grateful for the things that he's done. And we are expressing that. Now, we don't always look like we're grateful. But that's what it's all about. It's, an, it's a, a way of saying thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. I think of the song sometimes that I've sung. Now, I didn't come here to ask you for anything. I just come to thank you, Lord. You've answered a million prayers or more that I forgot to thank you for. I just want to thank you. And that's what it's all about. It's a thank you. And so we sing not because we're good singers. We may be or we may be terrible singers. But our hearts are enthroned with the, with the things of God. And we just want to express that to God. That's why we sing. So church, sing. If you've been changed, if your hearts have been changed, sing. And we express ourselves to God. You say, well, I don't like some of those songs that they sing. Well, maybe. But if you begin to look at the words of some of the songs that we sing and you just realize the theology and some of that and the expression of some of that, you'll understand that the people that wrote these songs did so out of a heart of love for God. And they meant something to them, and I think they still mean something today. It's a way we connect with God. You know, we're, uh, it's been all over the news lately, and most of you have probably seen it, that the things that's going on with the, with the Methodist Church, and uh, looks like it's all coming to a climax. And uh, is that my, excuse me, lost my microphone. Yeah. All right, I hope I didn't uh, belch or anything while I was doing that. Uh, but it's all coming to a climax now. It seems that uh, the, uh, there, was, there was a panel of 16 people got together and they've come to, to understand that we cannot agree. And so we're going to agree to disagree and basically go our separate ways. And this 16 panel of people made up by people both conservative and progressive have proposed a plan that would be presented at the uh, general conference in May. And this plan is simply a plan of separation. It's like a, uh, a divorce where there's irreconcilable differences. And at this point, we have understood that uh, there's enough fighting that's been going on, and over, mostly over human sexuality, and that because we cannot agree and the fighting continues, we have a, understand that we just need to separate. And so what that's going to look like, we don't know exactly, but here's kind of the, a general description of the plan. In, in May, the plan will be presented uh, as it's drafted and, and revised and will be presented to the general conference. 
And it will be basically this, that those that consider themselves traditionalist, conservative, uh, will have the opportunity to, uh, to align themselves with a traditional expression. Uh, one of those expressions is the Wesleyan Covenant Associations. They have been setting, getting ready and preparing for this, this day because they saw it coming several years ago. Uh, this book, actually, that I'm holding is from the first Web Wesleyan Covenant Association meeting. Uh, I actually attended that in Chicago, and the church uh, allowed me to go there. And it was a group of that time, around 1,100 people, uh, and it was a, a time of worship and all that. But basically, uh, that would mean that, uh, that there would be a separation, if you will. And uh, the traditionalists would, uh, would be allowed to have an, a gracious exit, still retain their properties. And also, as a whole, they will be, uh, as it stands now, they've agreed to give something like $25 million to the traditionalists to be able to, to get their start and to keep their uh, ministries going. Uh, this will take place, the vote will take place in May. And then in June, the annual conference, our Kentucky annual conference, will vote and, and we'll decide how we're going to go. And so there's a lot at stake right now. We need to be praying about all these things. But I wanted, you know, because it's all over the news, I bring this up today to say this, that I believe that any time that something like this is going on, that God has the opportunity to do something great. This is not the first time the Methodists have split, by the way. They split several times, uh, especially over the issue of, of slavery and, and those things. And they've, they've split, and uh, we've kind of splintered off in different groups. And here we are with this again. And so we'll have some decisions to make as a body. We'll have some decisions to make as a church. I, I kind of feel like I know what some of those decisions will probably be. But at the same time, uh, we realize today that uh, all of us are, will have to make some decisions. But as I look back, I think about that in the, time, the deepest and darkest times, those have been the times when revival has occurred. And we have the opportunity to see God do something great in our lives. This uh, coming year is what is known as the 40th, uh, see, the 50th year, Johnny, of the Asbury Revival. Johnny was, had the privilege of being a part of that Asbury Revival. Uh, if I can get the uh, things Wednesday night, I might try to show some clips from that. But the Asbury Revival, there's been more than one, but the, the one that uh, is really the, one of the most prominent was in 1970. And it started out as a 10 o'clock, just a normal 10 o'clock chapel time when people came together. And the dean that, that particular day, for no, whatever reason, decided instead of doing a, a, a traditional sermon, gave a testimony, a brief one, and then opened up to a time of testimony and prayer. And it broke out into a revival. And this was at 10 o'clock. And the actual president of the, of, of the college, of Asbury College, was out of the country at that time. And they called him and said, you're not going to believe this, but revival has broke out in Wilmore. And we don't know what to do because, you know, people are, it's around the 24-hour uh, prayer meeting is broken now. Reporters started up on that place and started coming in. And they said, when, the dean said, when you, the president that was away, Set, left his meeting and came back uh, from the country that he was in, came back to that revival, and he said it was, it was like in the middle of the night when he came. And he said he went on into the chapel anyway, and he said at that point, he said it was like an aura, a glow about the people in the place. And he said you could just, he was a little skeptical up to this time, but when he walked into this place, he said you sensed the power of God. Something was going on here. Lives were being changed. People were confessing their sins and praying. And people started coming from everywhere. Reporters came up on this place just to see. And many of the reporters said they thought they were only there for a few minutes and it turned out to be a few hours. People were captivated by this event. And this revival that started in Wilmore, Kentucky, went on for weeks. And it spread throughout different parts of the country. Because as the people got on fire at Wilmore and went to other parts of the country to share the gospel, revival broke out in other places. 
I believe God can do the same thing here. It may start on the campuses, and it may start in the church, and it may start in the homes, but it always starts with people praying and people confessing their sins to God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven. God says to us today, if you want it, it's got to come from him. We can't manufacture it, but it can happen. And so while some people see this as the end, I see this as the beginning of maybe something great. God wants to do a work. And I don't know what that's going to look like in you or in me. But I see that God's going to do something. God's going to do something great. The Holy Spirit, I don't think he is finished yet. So let's pray. Let's pray for revival. Let's pray for change. Let's pray for people to be get serious about God. And here's the thing. I think we all need to just confess to God that we are sinners and we need God's grace in our lives. It's something that you and I ought to be doing even now. Wesley said this. He said, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not a straw whether they are clergy or laity. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. If we get serious with God, God said, if you draw an eye to me, I'll draw an eye unto you. And that's what it takes. Now, I didn't come here to ask you for anything. I just came to talk with you, Lord. You've answered a million prayers or more that I forgot to thank you for. I just came to talk with you, Lord. Maybe tomorrow there'll be trouble and sorrow and a thousand teardrops may fall. But until I face tomorrow's task, I have no special favors to ask. I just came to talk with you, Lord.